I'm a former commander of the 148th Fighter Group, 179th Fighter Squadron, and uh, Chief of Staff, Minnesota Air National Guard. I retired on 26 August 1984 on my 60th birthday. Of course, I'm a native. I, I grew up in Duluth and uh, went to Denfeld. And then I enlisted in September of uh, 42, and I didn't get called up till January of 43. Then I went to pilot training. Then I got out after the war. And then I came back home. The war was over. I 55 mission, 20 years old, and I couldn't vote yet. I'd never owned a car, but I did have my own 51. Well, then I learned of a uh, I intended to come back to Duluth anyhow, but I learned of a guard up starting up back here. So I flew home one day in a Mustang, parked across the field, and uh, I landed in France in better looking bases than, than what we had across the field in, in 47, 48. And uh, first guy up in England was John Head, and says, how you do? And uh, we've been friends ever since. And then, uh, they had moved from the WP shacks on the civilian side of the field over to our side, and we had a plywood city or shack city, I guess you call it, all PWE shacks, maintenance, and ops. In uh, ops, we kept the records and had a pot bellied stove that would blow up in the middle of the winter and get our form fires full of soot, and, uh, and we'd fly in the snow. and uh, but uh, the good old days, yeah. Everybody knew how to shovel real well. We didn't have much snow re removal equipment, but uh, then along came the building. The hangar went up first. However, the, the Mustangs were still out in the snow. They finally got the roof on the hangar, got the hangar done, got ops done, supply. We built up a pretty good outfit. Then we got activated during a Korean thing, 21 months. Uh, I think about 25% of the airmen and 40% of the officers wound up going overseas during Korea. The rest of us, we stayed here. And I wound up going to all-weather school with Al Amatuzio, and we got to fly the 94B, then come back and fly the Mustang again. So uh, lo and behold, a couple of years later, we wind up with F-94Bs on our amp, and, uh, and it turned out to be a pretty good bird for us. Good shooter, yeah. In fact, we won the... Uh, 54, 94, all weather gunnery meet, flying the 94B as a fighter. Next year we won it again, and the third year we won it again. Yeah. We had the 94C, built up our back seaters, and then, then we got, of all things, the F-89J, the vacuum cleaner, the, the, the Scorpion. It had originally had 102 folding fin early rockets on it. It had Twin engines weighed a ton. In a, in a 94C, you'd plug in a burner and bang, it was like getting kicked in a tail. In the 89, kind of went when he cut in both burners. And one of our Wizzos, Charlie Nelson, coined the phrase well. He said, When you plug in a burner, it says it's just like a barge leaving a dock. <laughs> so it wasn't much of a thrill. But it was a good bird in that it had two engines and nuke capable. You know, uh, the first the first uh, Air Force fighter to carry nuke bombs. And then lo and behold, uh, goodbye 89s, we ferried them all out. And up comes a 102, which was really a thrill to fly. It, it, uh, it was a fighter, it, you, you strapped it on. You know, it was, you got in a nice small cockpit, big behind, but you felt like you're in a fighter and it flew like a fighter. The only trouble is uh, you are now the whizzo and you're now the pilot and you're now the navigator and you're the, the shooter and uh, you're, you're everything. And uh, we'd been all these years relying on that guy in the back seat to find a target. And so you had to learn that uh, running the radar and uh, flying the airplane and finding the target and all that sort of thing. But it, it was a good bird. We had it four and a half years, didn't uh, wrinkle a tip. And then uh, with 30 days notice, they flew in a bunch of one of wonders, voodoos from uh, from K.I. Sawyer. So all of a sudden, we're back in two-seat business. It's the only airplane I ever flew that 
it had a stick limiter, and when you pulled his max G's on it, it would shake. It would say, you know, you, you can't have any more, and it would shake at you. So you knew you were about to pitch up, and it had it had a misgiving of, of the pitch up, and that when you when you pull it too tight, the airflow over the the tail end would get disrupted, and the bird would snap and go like that. And if you didn't have 10,000 feet below you, you had to jump out. But it was a uh, it was very capable. And then 1976, in the middle of January, went out on a ramp and greeted some RF-4Cs that had come from all the way from Europe. But the uh, the Phantom was a great airplane. It was brute force uh, air-to-air refueling. We'd never done that. And uh, I'd often wondered, what's it like to air-to-air refuel? And uh, then it put us in the weeds, too, you know, uh, for for how many years have we been telling guys, no buzzing? And now we're, now we're down in the weeds at 500 feet, roaring at 400 knots, and noise complaints from the people up in the, up, up in the roots. I can remember one, one phone call, the guy said, how's old, my neighbor's having coffee. And he said, he's deaf, and he said, one of your guys came over and he said, his eyes got this big. <laughs> the guy couldn't hear him, but it scared him. <laughs> uh, then then my, my tour in the guard came to end in 79. Then I went state staff till 84. Uh, and uh, they asked me if I missed flying. I started out in the P-40 and wound up in the F-4. I only miss it if I see them or if I hear them. I'm glad I don't live too close to the airport. I miss you guys and I miss the outfit very much. <laughs>